Hey everyone, welcome to the 286th episode of the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and your co-host, Kevin Toffel. And we have a really packed show for you, actually. We're going to be talking about ARM's acquisition, a proposed acquisition by NVIDIA. We've got a Google event coming up. We also just did have an Apple event. Plus, we're going to be discussing alternatives to IFT if you don't want to pay for IFT Pro. We've got some updates from Down Under on making IoT devices secure and safer. Plus, Lots of news from product companies. We've got an update on Arlo, Wink, and its outage. An update on an old school lighting company called Stack. And we're going to celebrate briefly the birth of the working group at the IEEE that gave us Wi-Fi. Woo! I use Wi-Fi. What about you, Kevin? All the time. Exactly. Must celebrate. All right. And Kevin has a device that, I mean, if you can afford this, you should probably buy it because it's answering a lot of questions and will handle lots of things we get questions about. And we'll just be like, uh, did you get a firewall? But I do acknowledge that it's expensive. So you'll learn more about that in a moment. We're also going to hear from our new sponsor, Perceive, which makes the Ergo machine learning chip. And our guest this week is Mei Wong, who is a distinguished engineer at Palo Alto Networks. She's going to be talking about IoT device security. And yes, we talk about this all the time, but we do it because it's really important. And I know we have lots of new listeners and they'll be like, what? OT security? IT security? What? Segmentation on the network? So you'll learn all about that in things like zero trust computing. But first, let's hear from one of our sponsors. This week's sponsor is Ala Networks. Ala Networks is a leading provider of edge connectivity, device management, and application enablement for the Internet of Things. It allows the world's largest companies to connect any device on any cloud to any application. They have the fastest time to market. They are flexible and future-proof. Ala allows you to increase operational efficiencies, enhance the customer experience, and if you want to find out more, please visit www.aylanetworks.com. That's www.aylanetworks.com. Okay, Kevin, big news this week was not the TikTok deal, which also apparently happened. It was the $40 billion that NVIDIA said it would pay to buy the chip licensing company ARM, to which I'm still in shock. I think this is a crazy deal for a bunch of reasons. That's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And SoftBank is the company that is selling ARM to NVIDIA. SoftBank purchased ARM in 2016 for $32 billion. And so, yes, that is a 25% return, but the stock market's gone up by more than 100% in that time. So when you think about like annualized returns, it's not very much. However, it still feels like a lot. The reason that NVIDIA is doing this is because it really wants to get into the data center. And I wrote a lovely story about it. Y'all can read it if you want. I've covered semiconductors for 20 years, which is a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm saying that. So I'm not going to go into all of the stuff that I talked about in the article because it's too much. But the thing that is disappointing slash disconcerting to me is when SoftBank bought ARM back in 2016, it was all about the internet of things. The focus was about bringing the technology necessary to get a trillion sensors out in the world by like 2030. We're nowhere near that. And this deal four years later, is actually about the data center. Every time NVIDIA sells a graphics processor, which is what NVIDIA does, they have to hook it up to an x86. Somewhere in there, there's going to be an Intel or an AMD-based computer that is doing the general purpose computing tasks. And this makes NVIDIA sad. <laughs> <laughs> Why give your money to a rival when you could just do it yourself? And ARM is finally making credible strides in the data center compared to... In this has been a journey that ARM has been on for, again, over a decade. Well, almost a decade. And NVIDIA has been trying to get into the data center for over a decade. I remember sitting there having an interview with Jensen Huang, who is the CEO of NVIDIA. And he's like, yeah, corporate computing totally needs graphics processors. And I was like... 
Okay. But corporate computing does need machine learning and graphics processors turned out to be awesome at that. In fact, it was the addition of GPUs back in 2012. The use of GPUs actually allowed the convolutional neural networks that were being tested in a contest called ImageNet to just completely surpass and blow away prior years performance. And with that realization, everyone was like, oh my God, GPUs are great for machine learning. And NVIDIA really ran with that. And so now what's happening is we're very focused on machine learning, but we're still focused on not sucking up a lot of power to do all of our computing because computing is very power intensive. New data centers require a lot of power. So the idea here is we will get super amazing performance from the GPUs for machine learning, but we'll also have the power efficiency of an ARM processor. You can combine those two together and NVIDIA is the king of the world. But the downside here is what the heck happened to the internet of things. ARM has, not only is it in every smartphone out there, but it also makes microcontrollers that are the underpinnings of almost all the MCUs out there. Sorry, I should say ARM doesn't make them, ARM designs them and licenses the design to other companies who then make them. That gets into the other issue we've got here, which is what happens to all the companies that license ARM's designs, but also compete with NVIDIA? NVIDIA's CEO has said that, hey, we're not interested in the smartphone space. We're not going to compete with you there. But they are interested in the data center and Qualcomm, Marvell, plenty of other companies are building chips using the ARM architecture for the data center. And that's where I think things get dicey. Couple of thoughts. One random thing. I have an NVIDIA GPU card in my gaming rig, and it's got a couple dozen tensor cores in it, which I found interesting. Not that I'm doing machine learning, but game programmers can take advantage of that. NVIDIA has actually tried to get into the smartphone and the tablet market. And in fact, is also the chip inside my Android TV, which is interesting. Though I don't know what they're planning to do there. So yes, and by the way, their GPUs are in a lot of the higher end stuff, but at the lower end, it's ARM's Molly chips. So the opposite of synergies there. Yeah, I question one of the things that you've questioned, and that is, you know, how neutral will they be in terms of if this deal goes through, how will the licensees, how will their lives change, basically? I mean, I know they tweak the ARM designs themselves, but will they have some private and I don't want to say APIs, but some... Private designs that they don't license out? There we go. I'm sure they will. They will, but they have pledged to maintain neutrality on the basic designs. And yes, NVIDIA has an architecture license, which means they can change the designs up into a point where it would no longer work with the overall ARM software stack. So they'll probably keep tweaking their own stuff, but they hope that the Qualcomm's of the world, the Apple's, et cetera, will still want to have an architectural license and tweak their designs. But I did actually reach out to some chip companies to see what they had to say. And I, being an IoT person, reached out to the IoT peeps. And I got a bunch of really lame quotes, but I'm going to just give you a smattering of them so you understand where we're at, which is basically cautiousness. So Daniel Cooley, who is the SVP and Chief Strategy Officer at Silicon Labs, which makes radios, for the Internet of Things and also ties them to microcontrollers and application processors, says, quote, while details are likely to evolve as NVIDIA's proposed acquisition of ARM goes through the regulatory approvals, the announced structure of the deal would not appear to have an impact on our business. NVIDIA made it clear ARM will continue to honor its open licensing model and customer neutrality. Therefore, we expect to continue to have access to the ARM IP we need to continue to deliver Silicon Labs products. That's also a lovely reassurance for their customers, I'm sure, who might be like, uh, what? And NXP, another huge provider for IoT chips. And this is from a spokesperson at NXP. Like many others in the semiconductor and broader technology industry, ARM is an important business partner for NXP. We trust in the now ensuing global regulatory review process to ensure that this acquisition does not distort competition in the marketplace. So NXP, I won't call them salty yet, but they're definitely putting a little flavor into their thing saying we're not as confident, maybe, and regulators get on it. So one last thought, because you're talking about regulation and the fact that, you know, NVIDIA is going to honor the arm licensing agreements and so on. My question would be, and I'm sure this will come up in the regulatory hearings, NVIDIA will also control the pricing for future licensing costs. So what's going to happen there? Okay, so that's a lot on the ARM acquisition. Obviously, I could talk about this forever, but we won't. Instead, we're going to talk about events. An upcoming event, Google. They're having 
It looks like, what is it, a movie-like experience on September 30th? That's correct. It's kind of like a movie night theme, although depending on where you are in the world, it may not even be nighttime. And they're just we're like, hey, it is what it is. They have to do this virtually, of course. This would be their typical fall event where they would launch the Pixel phones. In fact, they even said, come see our new Pixel phones, our new Chromecast, and our new speaker. So we don't really care about the Pixel phones too, too much. And the Chromecast, probably not much either. But new Nest speaker sounds interesting to me. I agree. Well, I have a Pixel phone, so I'm excited about that. But sure, I actually am in the market for a better speaker. I've been waiting for Prime Day to get the Amazon Echo. When we moved, I have this huge open room and I need better sound quality. I know this is crazy. I moved the Google Nest display in there and it's just not doing it for me. I could buy the big $400 Max, but it sounds like I should wait till the end of this month. Oh, if anybody's in the market, I would certainly, certainly wait until September 30th. They may not be available product-wise right away. I don't know. But at least you'll know what's new and what's coming. Yeah. Plus, I was going to wait to October anyway. You'll probably see any remaining inventory of the older ones slash a little bit in terms of price. Oh, so smart. All right. Also, speaking of Google, this was interesting. There is possibly a new Nest thermostat coming out. It has hit the FCC. And the interesting bit here is that it has a 60 gigahertz transmitter in there, a radio that has not been on other Nest thermostats. The interesting thing about 60 gigahertz radios is that Google is using that for Project Soli which is their micro gesture system. And so what I think could be fun here is maybe you'll have, I don't know if we all remember this, but Kevin, I'm sure you do. When Google had their wave function on their smoke detector, the Nest Protects, where you could wave to turn off the alarm. And then they had to turn that off because it was not awesome because in a fire, you could accidentally turn off your smoke alarm before everyone heard it. But for your thermostat, maybe you make a little air gesture to turn the, the temperature up or down. Yeah, so it would be basically a touchless thermostat in, in this day and age where we're trying not to touch things. That's probably good, if it works, that is. And it might be cheaper. So I'm sure designers will appreciate this, but a lot of the haptic and kind of the touch-based feedback for a lot of these like dials, that actually involves quite a lot of electronics to be like, hey, this is where I am. So it reports back to the actual computing device in there and gives you kind of a good feel when you turn it on the thermostat. So eliminating that and making it touchless actually could save on costs. Well, plus uh, durability in terms of less moving parts. Oh, fewer moving parts, always good. All right, so we did say we'd talk about the other event. This week, Apple had an event in, I don't know, it felt like a letdown to me, but Kevin, you watched it, what'd you think? I watched the whole thing. I tend to agree with the common theme on Twitter, uh, and that was, is this a one-hour infomercial? All Apple events were infomercials. They were just better when you were in the reality distortion field. So, okay. Basically, not too, too much in terms of IoT that we care about, save for the new Apple Watch Series 6, which has a new sensor to measure your blood oxygen levels. It does so in about 15 seconds. It's just a little slow, but okay, compared to a traditional regular one, I mean. And then I noticed that they also put in a UWB or ultra wideband chip in there. And at first I was thinking, okay, is that how they're going to use Apple car key for the wireless opening of your door locks? But no, because you need an Apple Watch Series 5 or better, and that doesn't have a UWB chip. So the It's not for that. I'm starting to think, even though we didn't see AirTags mentioned at the event, I think Apple's just going to start putting ultra wideband chips in just about everything for tracking purposes. Yes. And explain to me what AirTags might be. They might be like tile Bluetooth tags, only they won't use Bluetooth. They would probably use this ultra wideband chip and Apple's Find My service, which is already available for all of your iDevices and your Macs and so on. And the benefit there, say, over a Bluetooth tracking system is they would know the last location of your device within a certain time frame. And if everybody's iOS devices has the capability to do this kind of tracking passively, they have a much larger potential audience, which makes it easier to find your things. Got it. And this is not just any location. This is ultra fine grained, which means that it can tell like where you are within centimeters, which is going to be amazing, I think. Yeah. So I use Bluetooth trackers and it just kind of tells me generally how far I am from a lost item. Here, it will probably give me direction as well as detail range. Yes, hopefully. Okay. 
So we'll look for that one day, maybe in October. I don't know. Last week, we talked about IFT. And the big news was IFT is creating a pro service that will cost, well, whatever you want for the time being. And by whatever you want, basically, we're talking about $1.99 a month or more with the goal of getting us all up to $9.99 a month if we think it's worth it. I don't have an issue with this. I know a lot of people are very frustrated. So for those of y'all who are frustrated, oh, and I should also mention that if you want to remain a free IFT user, you do get three free custom IFT recipes that you can make. And then you can also use any of the existing IFT recipes that have been made. So like Philips Hue has plenty of Philips Hue stuff. So you probably don't have to make a custom one of those. Okay. So, but if you're really hacked off and you're also like, "Mm, I really want to still make custom things, but I don't want to pay. I feel you. So here's some alternatives. The number one alternative that you're going to hear from people is Zapier or Zapier. I have no idea how to say the name. The downside of Zapier is one, it gets pricey after the five free zaps that you make. Two, They don't have a lot of smart home devices. This is much more if you're focused on the productivity side. They do allow for like Hue light bulbs and I think LifeX lights, but not a lot of other things. So there's that. The other is You Know Me. And this is, I've I've used this for years. This has actually a lot of smart home devices and some really nice recipes or applets or whatever you want to call them. And it is free. And they also offer, like they do a discovery thing when you sign up and it'll detect devices in your home and actually suggest recipes for you, which is nice. And then another option is Olisto, O-L-I-S-T-O. This I believe is a European company and it is very much like IFT, only it is a little bit more powerful in the sense that your trigger actions can be like, you can have multiple conditions associated with your trigger. And they call these, what do they call them? Trigs because everyone has to have a cute name for recipes. So their Triggs, they work with Philips Hue, they work with Somfy, SmartThings, Sonos, Instion, Spotify, LifeX, Nuki Locks, a lot of European companies. They have Nest on here, but I'm not sure if that's still current, given that Nest is older. They work with Legrand, Netatmo, or Netamo. Again, I have a hard time with a podcast because I don't know how to say anything. So works with a bunch of things. It's pretty powerful. So of all of those, it's probably the closest to IFT in terms of finding compatible recipes and it has a bit more power to it. So I would recommend trying all of those or trying one of those and seeing if you can do what you want to do. Can I make a recommendation? Please. I would look and see what devices you have. And then I would see how many of them are all supported on each of these services before I set up anything. Okay, fine. Maybe you don't want to play (laughs) around like I do. Or you could do that. (laughs) That is a very reasonable suggestion, Kevin. All right. So we're throwing those out there for you. Those are all software-based, which is why I picked them, because they're a little bit easier. But plenty of people are going to be turning to SmartThings or OpenHab or HomeBridge or... oh, Home Assistant? Home Assistant. That's what I was forgetting. But for those of you who are like... I don't have a spare pie running around, you know, that I'm loading my home automation server onto. These are probably some good options to play with. All right. So Australia, what have they done for us, Kevin? Well, they haven't done anything for us because we don't live there. But if you live in Australia, they have taken a similar approach to, I believe it was the UK recently that did something uh, with IoT device privacy and security. And what Australia has done, it's actually very similar. They put out a code of practice called Securing the Internet of Things for Consumers. There are 13 principles of it. I'm not going to run through them all because A, it's a long list, but B, several of them are just common sense. And we've seen these before, such as no duplicated default or weak passwords and implement a vulnerability disclosure policy, keep software up to date, ensure personal data is protected and so on and so forth. So very good to see this. And so if you are in Australia and using IoT devices, hopefully your device makers will start putting these principles into practice if they haven't already. Yes. And for the rest of the world, hey, Maybe check this out and see if we can't get something like that here. All right. It is time for our our speed news. Kevin, kick us off with Arlo. Arlo. So Arlo has a wireless video doorbell out. It's $150. That's not news. But 
they now have a wireless version of it that is news. It's $199.99. It's basically the same specs and functionality. It just gives you the ability to have a rechargeable battery in it if you'd like. Yes. And from the Wink world, you guys may have noticed if you are paying for the $4.99 a month subscription that Wink was down this last weekend. And that was upsetting to many people because they're paying for the service. And Wink said, hey, we're going to give you a week free, which... Yay. And Wink also in that same email touted their 98% uptime, to which I say that's like a week a year that we're not going to have Wink service, which not awesome, but I guess they already gave us that week free. Here's a dollar twenty-five. Take our money and go. Yeah, that's not what I'm after. Okay. And stack lighting. They made light bulbs all the way back in like 2015 that when you walked around, they had like motion detection and you would walk into the room, the light bulbs would be like, person, turn on. And then they would get smarter and they communicated with each other to get smarter. So it was a very cool system. They were purchased by Philips Hue. Well, actually they were purchased by Signify, the company that makes Philips Hue. And nobody ever knew what happened to them. I asked George Yanni last week at an event I was at, and he told me that Philips is using the technology in professional lighting, but it's pretty expensive. So they're not looking at it for residential lighting. So that's kind of a bummer for anybody who liked that experience. And I know a couple of y'all called in asking about that. So now you know. And finally, Wi-Fi is 30 years old. Actually, it's not Wi-Fi. It's the IEEE 802.11 working group. It held its first meeting September 10th through 14th in 1990, making that group 30 years old. So all of our 30-year-old IEEE engineers who helped create the 802.11 standard, thank you. I think I probably used it 30 years ago. No, they didn't have Wi-Fi 30 years ago, 1990. All right. Uh... Intel started running those ads in like 1995, 96. So 25 years ago. I mean, it was a long time ago. Don't get me wrong. Okay. Kevin, you played with the device and it sounds so awesome. Tell us about it. That's because it is, but it's going to cost you if you want it. So I don't know if anybody remembers, but about a year and a half ago, I reviewed the Firewalla Blue device. It was a small little box that you connect to your home network It ran an operating system on a micro SD card, Linux-based operating system. And I really, really liked it back when I reviewed it because it told me where my smart home device data was going, as well as my regular internet traffic. And I actually found out a couple things about where my data was going, servers outside of the U.S. that I didn't know about and so on. But it monitors your home traffic. It gives you your browser traffic info. It It has an ad blocker for the whole house. It had a no-fee VPN server that you could use while you're away from home safely, which is awesome. It had family settings for, you know, auto-blocking of violent sites, porn sites. It had safe search, social hour, so you could block all social networking apps for an hour and have some family time. Well, now there's Firewalla Gold. It's not 109, and it is not small. (laughs) It is big. It is $419 as an early bird on Indiegogo, and the MSRP will be $499 once the early orders are gone. So why is it so much more, and is it better? First, I'll answer the second question first. Yes, it's better because... It has beefed up hardware inside. Instead of an ARM chip, it has a much more powerful Intel processor. Instead of an SD card for your storage, it has built in 32 gigs of storage. Instead of one gig of RAM in the old Firewall of Blue, it has four gigs of RAM. It is a bigger device. It is a, it's a hot device because it's fanless. It has four Ethernet ports on the back because it is also, if you'd like to use it as one, a router for your home. So it's all the security features, all the data monitoring, and a router. I tested it for the past two weeks. It delivers on everything that I tested. All the same stuff from the Firewall of Blue, still there, still great. I actually did find out that my network was sending like one to two gigs of data up to the cloud every night. And it was from a Samsung device. And I didn't realize that because I wasn't monitoring the network, but the firewall of gold told me, and I went and looked at the details and sure enough, my speed test, automatic speed test configuration was set up to 
test the network once a day and I don't need to do that. So I shut that off. So this also scans for open ports on my network. None were found, which is good. So, and I know a lot of people have talked about this or asked us about this. You can even set up separate virtual networks or segment your home network, meaning you can put your IoT devices on a separate network segment that don't interact with any of the regular internet traffic. They're more secure. You can lock that network down if you need to. Call it a guest network on steroids, so to speak. Um, so that's nice. On top of that, and I only found this out just before the show, so I didn't test it. Because of the hardware specifications, because of the way it runs Linux, you can now put Docker containers on the firewall of gold. And Stacy, you know what that means. You can run things like Home Assistant, Pi-hole. Home Homebridge, Pi-hole, absolutely. So I didn't even know about that versatility when I wrote the review and I said, basically, this thing is awesome. If you want to know where your device data is going, if you want to make sure it's as protected as possible, if you want all of your data to be stored locally, because none of it goes from the Firewalla product to Firewalla. So it's all local. Yeah, it, it's a great device. It really is. But again, you're going to pay. Does it slow down your network? Because it is analyzing all your network traffic. Did you notice a slowdown? It's actually doing deep packet inspection. And that is another one of the benefits of going to the gold model because the blue model was capped at around 500 megabits per second. And I have a one gig per second network. Now, I saw a few slowdowns with the blue, but not enough to be cranky about it. This now supports three gigabit per second while doing its deep packet inspection. So flaming fast. All right. So I'm going to buy one of these. I'm going to practice network segmentation. It's going to be amazeballs. It is expensive, though. So if you're uncertain, but I know a lot of our audience is super nerdy networking people who have a lot of devices and want to play with this stuff. So I will add one thing. Because it's a router, it's not wireless. It's, it's a wired router. You now have, I think, more control over your wired network, and then you can just tack on a mesh wireless networking after it. And that's what I've done. My One of my Samsung Wi-Fi units is plugged into the back of this through one of the Ethernet ports, and my network is still wireless, still the same. My router is acting as a DHCP server. You know, the firewall is doling out IP addresses. I just feel like I have more control now. Yes. Oh, speaking of routers, by the way, Dave Zatz over at Zatz Not Funny has discovered that the Eero mesh routers, he discovered a Wi-Fi 6 capable Eero mesh router. So Ooh. presumably that will come out soon. When that comes out, what you should look for is do you have to buy all new mesh networks or all new beacons or things? I'm trying to remember the word they use for their like little separate units. The answer is probably going to be yes, but just keep an eye out for that. Okay. Now it is time for the Internet of Things podcast hotline. This is the segment of the show where we listen to you, our listeners. And this week's hotline is brought to you by Schlage. The best home automation offers convenience, not hassle. And with its built-in Wi-Fi, the Schlage encodes smart Wi-Fi deadbolt shows you just how easy, secure, can be. You can learn more at schlage.com. And if you would like to own your own Schlage lock, you should give us a call at 512-623-7424 so you could be entered to win this month's drawing. All you have to do is call us before the end of the month. And we call the end of the month September 30th at midnight Eastern. So give us a call and who knows, we might answer your question on the show. This week's question is very near and dear to my heart. So let's hear it. Hi, I'm Katie. I'm from Kitsap County, Washington. Due to the heavy smoke from the wildfires, I want to get a solution for my house to help with the air quality. So my question is, I'm looking for a connected air sensor and or unit that auto runs based on the sensor readings if needed and helps clean the air. Obviously smoke and um, maybe even as a bonus, humidity would be great because our house gets really dry in the winter if it has that sort of function. Ideally, I would like to be separate from the HVAC system, but it could be like in conjunction with it, but still like a separate unit, not built into it. So anything like that would be really cool and love the show. Thanks, guys. Bye. Katie, holler neighbor. 
I'm also in Kitsap County, and I am also choking on the smoke. And so I have already solved some of these problems for you. Although I will say good luck getting any of the tools that I mentioned because they are in hot demand. First up, I have been using for more than a year a device called the Aware Glow. And there is now a device called the Aware Glow C, which is an air quality sensor that also has an outlet in it. And the outlet lets you plug in a single device. So it could be a fan, a heater, a dehumidifier, a humidifier, or an air purifier. So what happens is when the AWARE senses poor indoor air quality, it will automatically turn on the air purifier. There are some caveats here. So the AWARE Glow C is $99. Oh, right now it's $89. So that's a perfectly reasonable thing to pay just for any air quality monitoring system. The triggering is kind of fun though. So when you do this, on an air purifier, I had it plugged into my Koei small air purifier, and it worked just fine. If you plug it into an air purifier, though, that needs you to manually flip a switch to turn it on, it may not work as well. Some will, some won't. And the reason that is, is because you can't leave it on all the time and have it automatically trigger on and off. You did that with a fan, right, Kevin? Right. I kind of cheaped out on an air purifier. It's a decent air purifier, but it's not smart. And I just figured I would add a smart plug to it and or an outlet and... That did not work at all because the device physically shuts off. There's no way to re-enable power to it without pressing a button. So the Koei air purifier that we use is actually the wire cutter pick. I've used it for like three or four years now and freaking love it. So as Kevin said, you may have a difficult time plugging in an older model air purifier into this or one that has a manual on off switch that may not work with a digital turning on and off. Okay. The other thing you should know, because you mentioned a humidifier, I have plugged in a dehumidifier because I have a basement area of my home. And the challenge I had running it with the aware was that when the humidity reached like 50% or above 50%, it would turn on the dehumidifier, which is exactly what I wanted it to do. But then the second the air quality got to like 49%, it would turn it back off. But because the humidity tended to rise fairly quickly, it would turn it back on almost immediately. It was not the most effective. Like I wanted it to have a humidity band that it would live in because <laughs> otherwise it was it was just weird. I don't know if you will have that problem. Maybe your humidity, once it gets low enough, will stay there. And you were actually talking about your room being too dry. So maybe that won't happen. I haven't played with a humidifier yet with this device. So, but I did want to present that as a potential issue. You can also, if you don't want to just do the formal trigger, you can also just schedule it, which is another lovely thing you can do. The final thing, if you don't want to do the outlet plus air purifier, you can actually buy smart air purifiers. My favorite brand, Koei, also makes a really expensive, it's like a whole, I would say whole floor air purifier called the Air Mega. It comes in like the 300, the 400, and the 500, and they range from like 500 to about $700, maybe even $800, depending on demand right now. And this is actually connected to the internet. You can control it via an app. It has a sensor that says, oh, air quality sucks, run now. So this gets you away from buying the $100 device to track your air quality and then the $200 air purifier for that room. So you're getting a smarts and a greater volume of air purified. And honestly, right now, I wish I had that because in my house, we're basically just physically picking up the air purifier and moving it from room to room. It's not optimal, but it's only for a week, I hope. So Katie, I hope that helps. And for anybody else out there dealing with this, I'm just going to say, if you want to get outdoor air quality measurements, the Purple Labs sensor is very popular. It's $249. Or you can buy a $200 sensor from Pigeon Labs that also helps create a map. Pigeon is, I think, more used in Europe, and Purple seems to be much more popular here. But yeah, good luck, y'all. Okay, that is the answer to this week's voicemail. If you would like us to answer your questions, give us a call at 512-623-7424. We should also say that last week we answered a question about the Amazon Echo being used in two different homes, and we're getting some feedback from people like, they're like, we can do it. So we're actually conducting a test tomorrow. I'm bringing over an Echo to a friend's house, and we're going to see what I can do, and we may come back and revise that answer. Yep. All right. So... Thank y'all for listening to this portion of the show. Please stay tuned for a message from our sponsor and 
our guest, Mei Wong, who is going to explain to us how IoT really affects corporate and industrial network security and what you can do to improve it. Hey, everyone, we are taking a quick break from the Internet of Things podcast for a message from our sponsor. This week's sponsor is Perceive. And today we're going to be learning about Perceive Ergo, which is bringing incredible accuracy to consumer devices at low power. And I have Steve Tyke, the CEO of Perceive, here to tell me about it. Hi, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing great. How about yourself, Stacey? I'm excellent. So, Steve, please tell me a little bit about Perceive. So Perceive is all about transforming sensing into perceiving. We have a chip, Ergo, which is a processor that brings data center level analysis inside edge devices. The way we do that is we can run some of the larger neural networks that people today run only in the data center. We can provide that level of accuracy running those large neural networks inside edge devices. That sounds great. So how much power is required to make this happen? Much less than you might think. Uh, we can actually run these large neural networks without using any external RAM, any external memory at all. And we're running in a tiny chip that's only in a 7 by 7 millimeter package. So in fact, we can run large neural networks in about 20 milliwatts, which makes us 20 to 100x more power efficient than pretty much anything else out there. Wow. So tell me what Ergo could do for, I don't know, smart home devices. Quite a wide variety of things, uh, starting with a sort of obvious case of home security cameras. We can do the same kinds of analysis of which people are on your porch. Are there animals in your front yard? Is this the FedEx delivery person or a friend of yours on the porch detecting sounds like is someone breaking your window and do all of that inside the context of a camera? But we can also do more playful things like having such a chip in your microwave oven. There are lots of buttons on your microwave that nobody knows how to operate. But if I walk up to my microwave with broccoli in my hand, the microwave should be able to say, oh, look, it's Steve and he has broccoli in his hand. And I know how he likes his broccoli. I'm going to set myself accordingly and cook it just so. So those are the kinds of things we can do. That's awesome. I'm assuming that processing at the edge also has implications for privacy and overall security too. Could you elaborate a little on that? Absolutely. We take privacy and security extremely seriously. And the fact that we can do all of this processing inside our chip without the creepiness of sending your data, your video, your audio from your house to somebody else's cloud intrinsically is preserving your privacy by being at the edge. On the security side, we're encrypting absolutely everything. We take security quite seriously. And the combination of our encrypting what runs on the chip with the fact that we don't let your data leave the chip and fly around the cloud is our attempt to mitigate the hacking that IoT devices are uh, subjected to. Excellent. So, Steve, where can listeners learn more about Perceive? Well, a good place to start is our website at perceive.io. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to the Internet of Things podcast. This is your host, Stacey Higginbotham, and today's guest is May Wang who is a Senior Distinguished Engineer at Palo Alto Networks. Hello, May. How are you today? Hi, Stacey. I'm doing great. How are you? Excellent. So we are here for two reasons. One, because I feel like it's been at least two weeks since I've talked about IoT security, and because Palo Alto has a new report out. So <laughs> I, I thought we should talk about that report and then just kind of help people understand where we're at right now with IoT security. Let's talk about the report. I thought it was kind of fun. Y'all asked people, what is the strangest thing that they have found on their networks? What have people found on their networks? Yeah, we had uh, some very interesting answers uh, for this question. There are increasing amount of IoT devices are connected onto our enterprise network, including smart ball, smart trash cans that can open by itself is actually connected onto the internet and the soap dispenser can actually give you real time data about how much soap has been dispensed every day. That is kind of crazy, but not super crazy. I, I always, I, I keep my IOT craziness with like, oh, connected fish tanks or connected socks. But with these devices, what is happening? Are people bringing these devices into the corporate network? Some of these things, I feel like they just get brought in. Maybe the facilities department's like, oh, we need a smart trash can. Uh, the, the survey also covered things like connected cars. And I assume those are employees bringing those in. How do these devices get there? 
That that was a very good question, Stacy. All these devices are actually brought in, can be brought in by all different organizations, not just the IT department. It can be facility, can be from finance, can be from operation, and of course, including employees bring in their own devices onto the network. So we're seeing the continued trend that increasing amount of all kinds of devices, not only in terms of increasing quantity, but increasing variety of IoT devices are brought into our enterprise network on a daily basis. Okay, and this is a problem because we are increasing our attack surface, but it's also a problem because IT departments usually don't know about this. So they're like, oh, here are a bunch of open ports in the network. So what do you recommend companies do about this? Yeah, so because now a lot of these devices not necessarily are brought in or managed by IT, lots of them by operational teams, for example, in hospitals, by clinical engineers from uh, manufacturing companies, and they're brought in by operational teams. So there are increasing amount of um, security challenges are brought in because of these IoT devices. And there are simple steps that we can further secure these devices. We think there are three main things we need to do to provide security to these IoT devices. Number one is visibility. We need to know at any given time what devices are connected onto our network. And number two, continue monitoring, 24 by 7 real-time monitoring of all the IoT devices connected onto our network. The device that was secure yesterday doesn't mean it is still secure today. It doesn't mean it's still going to be secure tomorrow. And the third one is take actions to do micro-segmentation, to segment mission-critical IoT devices into a separate virtual network so that we can do access control. We can really control who can access these devices. And actually, from our survey report, it shows more than half the organizations we surveyed, they foresee that they would need lots of improvements or even complete overhaul of their IoT security solutions. And there are 24% of the survey organizations reported that they don't have segmentation at all. I did see that. I saw that there were lots of companies who were like, oh, we need to make some improvements. I think 17% said, yep, we need to redo everything. So if we think of segmentation as the key, you've got two concepts here. One is segmentation. So segmenting out these devices into a separate virtual network, but then you also have the concept of micro segmentation. Can you explain the difference between those two concepts? They are actually very similar concepts, just to what degree you really segment these devices. And in order to do a good job in segmentation, the very first thing we need to do is to identify these devices not like in traditional IT network, we treat each node on the network as just an IP address. But for IoT devices, we really need to know what this particular device is. For example, we can identify two Windows operating systems, but one Windows operating system is running on my laptop and another Windows operating system is controlling an X-ray machine. Then if we do know one is X-ray machine, one is my laptop, then we only then we can do the right segmentation and can apply very different security mechanisms, security access control rules to manage the security of these two very different devices. Okay. And this seems like we've been talking about this form of, we'll call it network visibility and segmentation for a while in the IoT. And it feels like we're moving on to maybe a different form of security, or maybe it's an additive, but the concept is zero trust security or zero trust architecture. There's zero trust policies. Can you talk to me a little bit about what that means and how that might fit in to securing a network? Sure, sure. This uh, zero trust security is a very hot topic right now, especially it's especially important for IoT security because lots of these IoT devices are in critical infrastructure. 
unlike IT, when a device is compromised, we mainly talk about data privacy, proprietary information got leaked out. But when an IoT device is compromised, it can bring down the whole organization. And in healthcare, it can mean life or death. So we cannot even afford for malware, for a virus to affect this device even once. And traditionally, in traditional IT security world, we see a malware that works on, say, your device, and then we try to catch the signature, try to catch the malware again when we see it again at a different, in different organization or on different devices. But here, because the diversity of IoT devices and one device can be very different from another device, and we cannot afford to have a device down even once. So the very important concept is zero trust. That means before this malware, before this ransomware, even hack the device the first time, we can catch it. And the concept here is there are actually lots of signs before, just like heart attack. You know, even though though it takes a split of second for heart attack to happen, but it actually takes time to build up the the symptom. So if we can do real-time monitoring of the system of the IoT devices, we actually can catch lots of early signs. And their statistics shows now it takes more than 200 days before we can catch a malware. And there are actually lots of things we can do before any security catastrophe happens. So we really want to catch the attacks, catch the malware, catch the ransomware before it actually happens. So zero trust means by default, we don't trust anybody. We don't trust anything until we know it is secured. So one very effective way to do that is to use machine learning to do real-time monitoring of these devices' behaviors. And especially for IoT, because once we are able to identify what this device is, we know most IoT devices are purposely built for a fixed set of functionalities. For example, X-ray machine, it's only supposed to take images, archive images, a surveillance camera. It's only supposed to take um, uh, videos and pictures and uh, upload picture and video. That's it. So we know what the normal behaviors these IoT devices are supposed to do. So based on this whitelist or their baseline behavior, we call them device personality. And whenever abnormal behaviors happen, we can easily catch these abnormal behaviors. So my understanding was that Zero Trust dealt with devices before or as they entered the network. But what you're describing sounds more like we have a set of behaviors and Zero Trust begins the moment they start behaving strangely. Is that fair? Stacey, you're right. I think there are multiple layers of a Zero Trust concept. First of all, we when we do onboarding, we need to make sure this device is secure, is uh, trustworthy, and we need to have two-factor authentication. We need to have device onboarding, et cetera. And then after, even after this device has been onboarded securely, we need to continue monitoring these device behavior. And for all IoT devices, they don't really have the common capability that a normal IT device has. For example, lots of them don't even have the onboarding capability themselves, don't even have the login name and password, et cetera. So how we manage the full life cycle of IoT device, of IoT security, is actually a new challenge. Got it. Okay. So this basically means you should always be on your guard. You should never trust anyone. You can never relax, which means you should trust this to some sort of artificial intelligence layer. Yes? We do find artificial intelligence, machine learning can help us scale up the security solution, especially for IoT devices because of the massive amount of IoT devices and uh, large diversity of IoT devices. So what if the things that we often hear when addressing security is that it's got to be multi-layered. So 
you know, you're educating your employees. You're also, you probably have a firewall. You also are deploying some sort of monitoring and visibility system that uses machine learning to track weird behaviors and quarantine devices. You're also using micro segmentation. How should a company think about buying this type of multi-layered approach and setting it up and making it all work together because it's probably coming from multiple vendors? Yeah, there are definitely multiple cyber security tools, solutions out there. And uh, cybersecurity becoming more and more complicated as we are having more and more devices connected onto our network. And especially during the current COVID-19 days and the surface is increasing and the security risks are increasing as well. So we do find we got a lot of requests from our customers and potential customers. They would prefer an integrated solution, have as many tools integrated together as possible so that they, they can have a single pane glass to monitor all their devices, including IT devices and IoT devices. I think that would be a, a trend moving forward. And among our customers, we probably each customer have on average dozens of IoT uh, security tools. Got it. All right. And now for advice for people trying to set this up. So we we have in your survey all of the, I guess, the 17% who need a total overhaul or the 41% who are, are considering doing something. What is your advice to those companies as they try to reduce the threats and the attack surface opened up by all of these IoT devices? I think almost every time we talk to a customer or a potential customer, the very first challenge they are telling us is visibility. I think every organization needs an automatic tool to tell them in real time what devices are coming and go onto their network. So I would say that would be the very first step that you need to know about your network, about your IoT devices. Because IoT devices are used not only by pure IT people, and lots of them are being managed and operated by operational teams. So we cannot really expect every user is an expert in IT, in security, in networking. So it's very important to have automatic tools, intelligent tools, can take care of the management and the security of all these complicated devices so that, so that the operational teams can focus on what they're really good at, what their real main job is. It's very important moving forward with increasing amount of IoT devices. Each organization needs to have automatic, intelligent, scalable, integrated tools and we found machine learning is very helpful in terms of scale up the management and security of IoT devices. So I would ask you then, how do you get the OT side involved? Because a lot of time they have their own security efforts and protocols. And when IoT comes in with theirs, the OT folks are like, ho, ho, that's not really secure. So how do you bridge that gap between the two organizations? So not only we see for IoT security, we, not only we see technical challenges, we also see organizational challenges. Exactly as you pointed out, Stacey, lots of these IoT devices originally, back a while ago, they were not really connected, and they were managed and operated by totally different teams. And while network devices have been managed and secured by IT teams, and for example, in lots of mission-critical devices and industries, manufacturing or healthcare Lots of medical devices, they were not even allowed to be touched by IT teams. So now the question is, all these IoT devices started connected onto the network, and uh, who are ultimately responsible for the security of these connected specialized IoT devices? Is it the operational team, or is it facility team, or is it IT team, is it security team? And we do see lots of organizations are facing this challenge and moving forward, they're either trying to make operational team work together with an IT team, or they have one executive who can oversee both operational team and IT security team to be responsible for the overall IoT security of the whole organization. And actually, Gunnar even also suggested 
say, for example, in healthcare, that it's very important for the biomed team, which is in charge of operational medical devices and IT team, it's best for these two teams to work together in order to better secure the overall network security of the whole hospital. Got it. All right. That is a lot to think about and harder than it sounds. All right, May, thank you so much for coming on the show this week. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Stacey. That's it for this week. Thanks so much for listening. And remember, if you'd like more IoT news, sign up for my newsletter at StacyOnIoT.com. We'll see you next week. Thank you.